Senator Ludwig, Senator Dean Attali. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Now, for many months we've been told by this government that we've got a budget emergency. We've been told by the government we've got a debt crisis, that we're going to run out of money. Indeed, I think the Treasurer, uh, Joe Hockey, uh, went so far as to say that we were running out of money and that the cupboard was bare. And he effectively declared the country bankrupt. Now, you'd think that, faced with a crisis of such Herculean proportions, you know, conjuring up images of the soup kitchens of the Great Depression, that faced with a crisis of those dimensions, that a government would be looking very hard at potential <coughs> revenue measures and savings. It might look at the huge savings that could be gained from the enormous fuel subsidies given to industries like the mining industry. It might look at all of the depreciation benefits given to those same industries, worth billions of dollars. It may even look at things like superannuation tax concessions, things that benefit disproportionately people on very high incomes over those on low incomes. It might even look at something like negative gearing. It might look at revenues. It might say, well, maybe there is a case that, given that our big four banks are so profitable, that in fact we underwrite their success, that they should be obliged to provide a fair return. It might look at the current mining tax and say, well, why not strengthen it? Why not look at how we can ensure that we get a fairer share? of the revenue from the mining industry. It might even look at those industries that are ensuring they pay very little tax here, looking for tax havens overseas and involved in one of the greatest corporate tax avoidance schemes that we've seen. You'd think that might be a rational, reasonable reaction faced with this budget crisis that lies ahead of us. But what's their reaction? What's their reaction? Well, our budget emergency is so extreme, it's so severe, it's so catastrophic that faced with that enormous challenge, one of the first acts of this government is on this day to get rid of $20 billion of government revenue. $20 billion worth of government revenue. So, so just sit back and think about that for a moment. This is a budgetary crisis of such enormous proportions <coughs> that today we're wiping $20 billion from the budget bottom line. If there was ever proof that this budget emergency, this debt crisis, is simply a fabrication, something concocted in a coalition back room, today you've seen it. You've seen the evidence. You see, this debate today is not just a debate about the mining tax and the debate earlier about the clean energy laws and the carbon tax. Not simply debates about those taxes in isolation. It's a debate about the sort of country we want to be. It's a debate about priorities. It's a debate about whether we can provide the things that the Australian community <coughs> want. You see, we've got choices. We've got choices. We can choose to keep the revenue from the mining tax. We could have chosen to keep the revenue from the carbon tax. And we could have invested billions of dollars in health care, in education in science, in research and development, in vital infrastructure. We could have done that. We could have chosen to invest that money in those things that the Australian community say time and time again, this is what we want our governments to do. The other choice is this. We abolish these taxes, we slug the sick, the poor, the young, in an effort to implement our agenda, which is a harsh agenda that says 
Get out of the right government. If you're sick, if you're poor, if you're young, we're no longer going to look after you. It's a great tragedy because we had an opportunity today not just to save the mining tax but to improve it, to strengthen it, to return back to the original tax proposed by Kevin Rudd, backed by Treasury, to bring in billions of dollars more of revenue. And it's a fair tax. It's a tax that says if you're making extraordinary profits, most of which go offshore, well, you owe the country a fair share because the resources, the minerals underneath our feet belong to every single one of us. And that's what we should have been doing today. So how do you reconcile where we've got to? How do you reconcile the mismatch between the rhetoric and the actions of this government? How, how can you understand that at a time when we have this enormous budget emergency, we're slugging those people who can least afford it and abolishing these sensible sources of revenue? And I, I think the answer represents everything that's wrong in Australian politics. I, I think that's where it comes from. Um, it's a testament to the power of lobbyists and vested interests who have got unprecedented access to the decision makers in this country. Every day you see it, walking through the corridors, knocking on doors, inside and outside of ministerial offices. People who are here to advance their own interest ahead of the national interest. And of course the line becomes blurred. The line between what is a lobbyist and what is a decision maker has become more and more blurred in this place. We're now seeing people from industry become employed as members of staff and indeed in some cases become members of parliament doing the bidding of big business rather than putting the national interest first. But it's not just a story of the power of special interests, it's also a story about the lack of political courage and conviction. And it is the lack of political courage and conviction that gives these special interests in this place their power. Because we no longer believe enough in a cause to take a stand and say, we will fight this. We will fight this and see it through. And we've seen it on a number of other reforms. We saw it with poker machines. We saw it recently with junk food advertising and junk food labelling. We've seen it with alcohol. We've seen it with a number of areas where the interests of a few are put ahead of the national interest. We need to realise that those groups only have their power because we give it to them, because we're not prepared to take up the fight. We're prepared to cave in in the face of cashed up advertising campaigns. We need to ensure that we put the interests of those people who want a decent education, decent health care and welfare, if they're down on their luck, welfare support. We've got to put their interests first. It's also a story about the huge disconnect between our politicians and the community. And there is an emerging disconnect here. When a government chooses to abolish sensible revenue measures and implement a budget so harsh, so brutal, so severe, something that effectively destroys the social contract, something that was built over decades, you know something's wrong. We've heard a lot of discussion about mandates and this government's mandate to implement these policies. But these choices were never put to the Australian community. What is happening now, right now, is that we have a government that is governing not because it was honest enough to put these choices to the Australian community, but simply because it's not the current opposition. That's what the last election was about. The election of 2010, of 2013, could have been summarised in this way. 
Vote for us because we're not them. So that's your mandate, to govern because you're not the opposition. It was an election campaign that was devoid of any vision, of any ideas, of any policies of substance. So don't mistake your election victory as a mandate to abolish these sources of revenue and instead tax the sick, the poor, the young. Don't make that mistake. The truth is you were too frightened to put those choices to the Australian community. And you know why you were frightened? Because you knew you would lose. Faced with the choice, do we want a fair mining tax and a decent education system, a decent health system and welfare support for people when they're down on their luck? We know what the Australian community want. They've said it time and time and time again. Most Australians want decent health care. Most Australians want to be able to go to the doctor and not have to think about their bank balance before they do it. Most families want to send their kids to university and not have to think about what the legacy of that education will leave their children. Most Australians want an adequate investment in infrastructure. They want fast, frequent, reliable public transport. They want an investment in science. They don't want cuts to CSIRO. They want to see that institution expanded and grow. They want an investment in research and development. And they would support a, a stronger mining tax if they knew that that was the choice in front of them. But you didn't give them that choice because you lacked the courage to do it. Because you know your vision is so brutal, so unpopular, so lacking in support that you were afraid to put it to the Australian community. And instead, we have a government that uses the word mandate as though it has some meaning. You're only governing because you are dishonest and because you're not the opposition. That's why you're here. So I just say this simply to Mr Abbott. If you are determined to scrap these taxes and if you are determined to shred the social contract that we fought so hard over so many decades to establish, know this, you do it at your peril. 